Hello everyone, good afternoon. I am back with you, back from the flu, 80%. Thank you guys so much for your understanding of my inability to be with you yesterday. Um, just no way that I would have been capable of giving you the enthusiasm and the level of love and support that I hope you've come to expect from these lectures. We are together tonight talking about thalamic strokes, strokes that happen in a part of the brain called the thalamus. And as always, I am going to try to come to you with what we call the neuropsychological perspective. What this means is talking about some of the aftermath of stroke that might not be as readily accessible to other people in your life. So I'm talking about things like cognition, the way our brain thinks and learns and memorizes and finds our words, and also our mood, our behavior, our personality, how things like stroke can affect those parts of our functioning. This is our third in a four-part series on stroke. Next time we're going to be wrapping up by talking about the pons. So let's get started by talking about the thalamus. The thalamus is a very, very complicated part of the brain, and the name thalamus means inner chamber in Greek, and it sits on top of the brain stem, right in the center part of our brain. And I'm going to, in our new tradition of using visual aids, I just want you to get a general sense here of where it is, right smack dab in the middle. It is divided into many different areas and all the different parts of the thalamus are then further connected into other parts of the brain. So the way I want you to think about it is it's kind of like a hub or a relay station that is in between the two primary parts of the brain. So when you think of the brain uh, before you have had something like a stroke, you probably just thought about it like this. This is the outside part of the brain. This is the gray matter or the cortex. And many people don't realize that um, this is just the outside. The inside part of the brain is called the subcortical area and it's made up of a lot of different structures and this part of the brain, the outside part, is where we really store information. But of course the brain has to do so many things before it can actually get to the point of making a memory where it stores it here in the cortex. And so what the thalamus does is it's really a relay station between these two parts of the brain, the outside cortex and the inside inside uh, subcortical area. If you break down all of the different parts of the thalamus, you can see how very complicated it is. So what we have on each side here is usually uh, about the size of a walnut in the average person. And although this is actually very, very small, look how complicated it is. It controls so much of our bodily functions that is, it's pretty remarkable. And so once we start talking about this, you're going to realize why the symptoms of stroke um, can be so complicated in this part of the brain. And in fact, there are some scientific journal articles written about the thalamus um, instructing doctors that when you see someone who has a very unusual set of symptoms, think about thalamic stroke because there's just so much going on in this very, very small amount of brain space that depending on which part of the blood supply is cut off, you can have wildly different symptoms. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, there are a couple reasons why these thalamic strokes are so complex. The first one I've already told you, it's because it's just a very complex complex part of the brain. But the second reason is a little bit different. It's very interesting. There are what we call normal variations in this part of the brain that are fairly common. And what I mean by that is we think of the blood vessels in the brain happening, uh, developing and supplying blood and oxygen to the brain in most people in a very, very prototypical way where you could open a textbook and you could look at uh, say the middle cerebral artery and in a certain percentage of people it's going to look exactly like it looks in that textbook. Well there are also alternatives to this called normal variations where some people's the shape, the size, the diameter of their blood vessels is just not that textbook. It's not to say that it is abnormal. In some people there are uh, venous malformations that can go on to cause stroke. But these things called normal variations are just that. They're just 
Uh, in a subsection of people, the way that their blood vessels grew in a certain part of their brain just happens to be different. So the thalamus is actually a part of the brain where this is more common than in other parts of the brain. So because of that, um, we see that um, things that happen in the thalamus result in more unusual neurological symptoms. So when we talk about the thalamus and thalamic strokes, you have to think about two things. You have to think about, did the person have what we call a pure thalamic stroke, which are actually quite rare, or are we really talking about someone that had a stroke and part of the damage that happened was in the thalamus? So many patients who are told that they've had a thalamic stroke actually have lesions in other adjacent parts of the brain. So this can be in the cerebellum, this can be in the basal ganglia. Most people have not just damage to the thalamus. Isolated thalamic stroke typically happens in older folks. Risk factors for thalamic stroke um, are broken down in the majority of studies like this. First and foremost, we do think of them as strokes that happen to relatively younger people or in middle age more commonly. And high blood pressure is the number one risk factor that is associated with these types of strokes. And in one study, it was about 70% of people had a history of hypertension. High cholesterol was the next risk factor. Type two diabetes, atrial fibrillation, cigarette smoking in about 17% of people, and migraine headaches in about 7% of people. Um, the presentation, acute presentation, meaning when people go to the emergency room with these types of strokes, tends to be a loss of coordination or balance, numbness or tingling facial paralysis in one part of the body, double vision or drooping eyelids, headaches, nausea, difficulty with speaking, and many people can come in very sleepy or actually lose consciousness completely. In about 90% of people, the stroke begins and ends within one hour. It's only in about maybe 8% of people that we actually see that there's a progression of the stroke symptoms over the course of two to 24 hours. And that probably has to do with how little something we call the vascular territory is in these thalamic strokes. So remember, even though I showed you this picture before, you know, this is a blown up version of this pretty small part of the brain right here. So it packs a punch in a very small amount of space but what that means is that the blood vessels that are giving us the problem, either through a blockage or through a hemorrhage in the two different kinds of stroke, really only have but so much territory that they're supplying. And this turns out to actually be a good thing when it comes to stroke. Um, the presumed cause for the stroke in the vast majority of people is something we call small artery disease. Um, the next largest um, contributor is cardiac embolism. So you can have a blood clot in your heart and as it pumps and makes its way through your uh, vascular system, it can get caught up in the blood vessels in the brain. There's something called vasculitis, which also predisposes people to strokes in the thalamus. And in 8% of people, they're never able to actually find what the cause of the stroke was. So remember before, what I said, the name of the game with these thalamic strokes is difference. It is complexity. I cannot sit here and tell you these are the one, two, three things that happens after you have one of these types of strokes because it's just so, so, so complex. However, if we can try to break them down into some level of organization, I think that would be helpful. So the first thing that I think about with these strokes is what we call hemisensory loss. So this is basically a line going right down the midline and people either have difficulty with one of the sensations. So most commonly is temperature, it is pain, and there's also just kind of general touch or sensation. That is the most common symptom and people can either have that with a motor deficit, so this is actually trouble using a hand or a leg function of this part of the body, along with a neuropsychological deficit. So most commonly in the thalamus, this is memory problems, 
and this can also be what we call thalamic aphasia, which is some difficulty with motor programming and finding speech, and I'm going to talk to you about that in detail a little bit later. We also see that there is what we call kind of a frontal lobe syndrome where people's emotions can get very, very flat. There are visual field defects that happen in these strokes and a lot of people have difficulty with the sleeping and waking system following these strokes. Now we're going to spend some time talking about sleep difficulties. Um, in stroke because they're so common, but um, I want to talk specifically about these thalamic strokes because they're really, really, really making people very, very sleepy and we have to talk about what to do about that because sleep is so unbelievably critical for stroke recovery. It, next to intensive rehab, good quality sleep where you go in and out of REM and non-REM sleep is probably the most important thing and you need to be able to advocate for yourself to get that good quality sleep. One of the most common things that we think about happens after thalamic stroke is something called central pain syndrome. And we cannot talk about the thalamus without talking about central pain syndrome. So um, this is an unbelievably, catastrophically painful thing that can happen to people, um, either through direct injury to the thalamus, or there is something called pseudo thalamic pain syndrome when the white matter of the brain uh, loses, gets the connections broken um, between the thalamus and the cerebral cortex. Remember this outside part that I was talking to you about before. So the thalamus isn't itself injured, but the connections are. So usually what happens is there's an affected arm or an affected hand or a specific part of the face and there is a disturbing, repetitive, burning, almost like a freezing kind of a sensation. People will say it feels like I'm being stuck with pins over and over and over again. Um, it's interesting in that it doesn't typically happen immediately following the stroke. In about 63% of people, it happens within the first month. Um, it can be either constant or intermittent. The prevalence rate is about 9%, but we actually think that this is an underreport because so many people get dismissed as having psychological problems instead of being properly diagnosed with a central pain syndrome. And that is so, so, so painful for me to hear and, and people who are brain health advocates, neuropsychologists, we just get so bent out of shape about that because um, pain is so subjective and you can't, we have all these little faces and we ask people to quantify their pain, but the truth is it's subjective and nobody can know your pain. And when a doctor who is supposed to be the authority invalidates your experience, I can only imagine how unbelievably uh, rejecting that that feels. So this is something that we really need to validate for people with these strokes. Obviously, if you are in chronic intense pain, it can be a very significant roadblock to recovery. Um, it's very difficult to make the leap in our mind from the pain that we all experience to something like central pain. So there's a couple key differences. So when you or I, who let's say you've not had a thalamic stroke and you're watching because a spouse has, um, an injured uh, motor nerve, the minute you hurt it, you have the sensation of pain, ow, right? And it can only carry but so much current. Well, central pain is different because injured pain nerves that lead to neurons in the brain that process pain actually experience pain in a cumulative way and there's actually a delay. So it's kind of like the more rev that you get on it in the body, the more pain you're going to experience in your brain. And what can happen is the more that this signal increases over time, the experience of pain kind of spreads in the brain and what you get is neighboring neurons, these little brain cells that are living all around the part of the, the brain cell area that's causing the experience of pain. Um, you basically get other brain neurons start to fire even though they're not actually being stimulated. And so what you basically get is these violent bursts from the thalamus that give the experience of excruciating pain. And what can be so difficult is that 
even the lightest possible touch can stimulate this feeling. And so a lot of times people with central pain have to wear very light, minimal clothing because even something like a cotton sheet going across their face can set off these unbelievable waves of pain. Unfortunately, this type of pain does not respond very well to anything but the strongest narcotic type of pain relievers. And so people have to live with um, something that is extremely debilitating. Of course, in addition to the physical pain caused by these misfiring neurons, we also have a psychological impact, not just for the person, but also for the caregiver because we can start to live in fear of having some of these triggers tip off this unbelievable pain response. And so people can become very avoidant and very isolated in life because they're so petrified of this horrible pain being set off. Let's talk about some of the physical symptoms that can happen after thalamic stroke. So the first one, like I said, is kind of that hemisensory loss. And so people who I've met with who have thalamic stroke will literally draw me a line and tell me that their pain, I mean, you could just write, right, right down the middle. Um, and often what it is, like I said, is difficulty with sensory perception. So the ability to truly feel temperature, touch, pain. Um, and it can also um, give something called a dissociated loss where people can kind of lose their ability to know where a limb is positioned in space. And this can give the feeling or the illusion almost, um, people either describe it like they've lost their limb or they can see their limb visually, but it just doesn't feel like it's part of them. So there's a few different names for this kind of phenomenon. One of them is called alien hand syndrome. And it's even been written about in the book where people can look down and they can see one of their hands actually buttoning up a shirt, but they don't have the psychological feeling of ownership like their hand is actually doing it. So it can definitely get um, complex. We have a lot of vision symptoms that happen in these strokes. Um, the most common that I think about are vertical gaze dysfunction, so difficulty going up and down with the eyelids. Um, we can have double vision very commonly or visual field loss. Um, let's talk about the sleep stuff because that is very, very, very important. So the thalamus has a key role in sleep production and just general arousal. Remember what I was saying before, people who go to the ER with thalamic strokes, they can be very sleepy to the point where they can almost be unconscious. Well, this is because the thalamus is part of the system that keeps us awake and puts us to sleep. So after these, after any stroke, like I was saying, people have a much higher need for sleep. And in fact, it's such an important topic that I think I should do a whole lecture on neuro fatigue because it's actually a sign of brain recovery and it's, it's just so critical and it, it really deserves its own half hour. But what we're gonna focus on now is these thalamic strokes. And what we know happens is that the sleep requirements change significantly um, after these strokes and what we see is that people need over 14 hours of sleep when they've had these strokes and what we find is that this can actually be disabling for about the first year where people are just so unbelievably tired that it can really interfere with their ability to get back to the life that they want. Um, what we see in thalamic strokes is that the fatigue hits after meals in particular and between the hours of 2 to 5 p.m. most intensely. Naps typically last over an hour in these type of strokes and most notably it can be very hard to wake someone up from a nap who's had a thalamic stroke because this arousal system is having a hard time. Um, what we see in these strokes is that day sleep and night sleep is actually very similar. People are not losing REM sleep after a thalamic stroke typically. It's actually non-REM related sleep. So that's actually good. Um, however, we need to be able to help people get the highest quality sleep that they possibly can so they have the best recovery. Changes in mood and personality after these strokes tend to be um, more a case of apathy than um, 
the irritability and the over emotionality that we sometimes see in other strokes and this is because of the connections with the frontal lobe so people can just become a little bit more flat their emotions can just become you know not too low not too high just kind of blah. and that is concerning of course because we need energy and we need initiative and we need focus um, in order to make our best recovery so in terms of the cognitive um, symptoms what you typically see um, is verbal memory problems so amnesia in particular and something called confabulation is very common so that basically means believing elements of a story that aren't necessarily true or didn't necessarily happen so kind of a form of misremembering so a confabulation might be that you went to the store yesterday and um, you bought cupcakes for somebody when really you did go to the store but you didn't buy any cupcakes at all and and it feels in your mind like this exact thing happened but it's actually part of the the brain damage that's happened from the stroke now that part doesn't last too long that's more in the acute recovery phase um, but we also have something called thalamic aphasia which is basically um, trouble um, specifically with proper nouns so people places or things just really hard to find um, very specific type of words that we're looking for so we do see some differences in left-sided thalamic strokes and right-sided thalamic strokes in terms of the type of cognitive symptoms that we see so what we see is people who have the strokes on the left side tend to have more of the aphasia or the language based symptoms and people who um, have the deficits on the right side they tend to have more of the visual memory problems so difficulty remembering things like how to get from point a to point b so let's talk a little bit about recovery specifically as it relates to thalamic stroke you guys know that therapy of course is the cornerstone of recovery and that it has to be intense ideally it's early and that it comes from a team of experts that genuinely care about you i know that you guys are all over the world and have different levels of access to rehabilitation and brain health experts but i want to strongly encourage you to get the very best team around you that you possibly can so there's an upside and a downside to thalamic stroke recovery uh, the downside i would say is that it can absolutely be more challenging because there's so many areas of the brain that are involved when you have one of these types of strokes However, prognosis is actually better for a thalamic stroke than it is someone who has had a cerebral cortex stroke. So that's good. So that's just going by the statistics in the rehab literature. About two thirds of patients are reported to be able to return to their previous level of functioning. The ones that seem to have the most difficulty are people that have thalamic strokes on both sides of the thalamus. So remember I was saying before there's a left side and a right side. So you can of course have a stroke just in one side and it would be in any of these little structures that we have here. Remember, it could also be both sides. It could be the whole thalamus plus an area that was all the way around it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we know that the people who have the most difficulty are the ones that um, have these bilateral on both side um, strokes. Patients who have had thalamic strokes who have participated in three months of intense multidisciplinary rehab do the best. I would argue that that's the case for every person who's had a stroke. That just happens to be some data on thalamic stroke that I found. Um, I, I did want to talk though about the circle back around to post-stroke pain and sleep. Um, the prognosis for people who have central pain syndrome depends a lot on the extent of the person's stroke. Um, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions are typically used. So all I mean by that is medications versus more behavioral strategies like trying to distract from the sensation of pain, making sure that it doesn't consume your everyday uh, activities doesn't consume your identity that it's not the only thing you talk to people in your life about 
but it's such a physical sensory experience that I think realistically um, trying to help people on an actual physical pain level has to be the priority so they've tried everything from antidepressants there's something called tricyclic antidepressants which are the most commonly used but even things like antispasticity drugs people can get Botox injections um, people can use anti-seizure medications just anything to come remember I was saying before in the brain those pain centers can just fire 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 and they almost take on a life of their own so all the pain medications what they're trying to do is calm 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 for people who find no relief in the pain medications there are new attempts to actually go in the brain either through um, stimulation directly or indirectly so deep brain stimulation has been used something called transcranial magnetic stimulation has been used spinal cord stimulators have been used um, we just don't have enough well-designed clinical trials to be able to really um, give more specific guidance with these Finding the right doctor for pain is absolutely crucial. Um, some people get very lucky with their neurologist and they feel that they can manage their pain as well, but other times you are gonna need to find a pain specialist. Um, let's wrap up by talking about how important sleep is for your stroke recovery. Um, there's two things about sleep that make it absolutely invaluable, and the first one, of course, is all of the repair that is going on during certain phases of sleep and also the amount of oxygenation that happens during sleep and so we know from animal models from human models that if you are not getting optimal sleep after a stroke you will not recover to the best of your ability and so this is why we need to make sure that we're not just focusing our rehab on the things we can see. Physical therapy is unbelievably important, hugely important, but we can't do it to the exclusion of other types of therapy or just allow someone all of their medical care to be focused on stroke symptoms. People have a right to have other medical problems. Maybe they had obstructive sleep apnea before the stroke and it just wasn't that important or it didn't it wasn't um, out there as something that needed to be the focus of care but now because the quality of our oxygen getting into our brain to help with recovery is so important we want to revisit it so don't ever let anyone um, minimize the amount of assessment and treatment that you are getting post stroke to just let's just focus on what we can see I want you to make sure that your sleep is as good as it can absolutely be so um, one of the things we know is very common um, post stroke is that people can actually develop new sleeping problems so this goes anywhere from post stroke insomnia all the way up to restless leg syndrome again to um, different types of sleep apnea so one thing I wanted to encourage you to do is if you sleep with a partner is ask them are you snoring does it sound like you're stopping breathing um, are you moving around a lot at night if it if if you don't have someone to ask, then I want you to ask yourself if you feel rested after you get up from a very long period of sleep. Are you sleeping more than five to six hours continuously every night? The name of the game with sleep and recovery is long periods of uninterrupted sleep. It's no good if you're eight hours are bits and pieces here and there. What you have to do is make sure you're getting really long stretches of sleep where you can, your brain effortlessly goes in and out of REM sleep and non-REM sleep. One of the psychological benefits of good sleep is that it is basically trauma therapy. And you know how I feel about strokes being traumatic events for the majority of people. When we are in certain stages of sleep, our brain is trying to make meaning, make sense of what has happened to us. So often a stroke is unexpected and it's life-threatening and it changes so much of our everyday lives and, and what we have grown to expect from life. And so this type of kind of emotional processing that we can do in our sleep is actually very, very therapeutic and it's gonna really help you
to wrap your head around what has happened here and how am I going to go forward with this new difference that is in me. Thank you guys so much for listening to me tonight. Um, I did want to just end by saying if you need more support than you have in life, I really want you to try to find communities online that can give you very um, much needed support. There's a wonderful group called the Young Stroke Survivors Global Network that I am very lucky to be welcomed into and people give such amazing support and ask such good questions and give such good information. If you don't know about those guys on Facebook, please go check them out. I know they would be more than happy to have you. It's, it's kind of a overwrought phrase, but the truth is it really does take a village to get through things like this in life. And so if you're out there listening to me, I know it's because you want information and you want support. So don't just have it end here with me, okay? I want you to keep going out there and keep pushing for answers because it's what you really need and deserve. I will be back with you again next Wednesday and we are going to talk about the pons. That's a part of the brain stem and we want to talk all about what happens when that part of the brain gets injured. Um, if you like this video, if you think this lecture was helpful, I would really appreciate you sharing it because um, so often people who are living with these strokes and people who care about them just don't have enough information. That's a huge reason why I try to come to you once a week is to just have us all get on the same page. There's no reasons for doctors to be the only ones out there who know all this amazing information about the brain. You too deserve to understand it at exactly the same level that someone like me does. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye bye.